Welcome to The Significance of Wealth with Tom Ruggi, founder and CEO of Destiny Family Office. I'm Marty Salt. In each episode, Tom brings you interesting topics and guests that reflect the independent thinking and tailored strategies he uses with his own multifamily office clients, exploring the evolving landscape of wealth management and ultra high net worth, shedding light on the large sphere of alternative and private investments, and delving into the world of collecting as both a passion and investment strategy. Ultimately, he looks at success with a broad lens that may well transform the way we all define the significance of wealth. Welcome to the Significance of Wealth podcast. I'm your host, Tom Ruggi, and today my guest is a very good friend of mine, Joe Sabatini. Joe is the president of Festivals of Speed. Since 2004, Festivals of Speed has been the ultimate luxury showcase for enthusiasts with a passion for exotic and classic cars, motorcycles, boats, and aircraft. Held in the most scenic venues in Florida and Georgia, Festivals of Speed also features luxury lifestyle brands, premium wines and spirits, artwork, watches, and cigars. Joe, welcome to our podcast. Thanks for having me, Tom. It's great to be here as always. So Joe, I'm I'm really excited to have you on the podcast. We've worked together for more than a decade. We've been friends for much longer than that. When we started our family office division, Destiny Family Office, I knew I wanted to be a major sponsor at every single event that you do, and I'm honored to have our company name on every trophy that you present to your attendees. But to start with, can you tell our listeners just a little bit about you and how Festivals of Speed got started? Yeah, I'll be happy to. So this event basically started about 21 years ago, right here in in downtown Mount Dora, actually, where where we're both from uh, or live currently. Uh, we started, it, it, it grew out of my other business. I had an art gallery and I had a beer and wine license with the courtyard. So I used to throw art openings and small gatherings. And one day the Ferrari group came into town and they asked us, they said, we're going to be in town for two or three days. We're looking to, to do things, to be entertained. And they said, we love your art gallery. We noticed you have some automotive art, uh, cause I always had a passion for this. So one third of my gallery was vintage Ferraris driving in the old Targa Floria races back in the 50s in Italy. And uh, even though I didn't really have that buyer, I just loved it myself. So this Ferrari club came in and we threw this this really wonderful party. We had the guests lit lanterns and fine wines and bourbons. And uh, they, they purchased all of the Ferrari art and all the automotive art that night. Every single bit of it was purchased. And I was just really shocked by that. I was, kind of the light bulb going off saying, wow, there, there's yeah, something here. The, the light bulb went off, but I was just like, this is fun. These guys are they're good people. They're, their wives are having a good time because they're looking at art. The guys are having a good time because they're talking about cars and drinking wine. And... Uh, the Lamborghini club came up to me about a month later and they said, Hey, we heard you through this great party for the Ferrari guys. What about us? And I said, well, I'll throw all the parties you want. I just need sponsor dollars to kind of continue this because it is an expense. Mm-hmm. They said, just go down to the dealer, tell, tell them all we're going to be there and they're going to give you a check for a thousand dollars. So I did that and they gave me a check for a thousand dollars. And they said, just keep entertaining those guys and let us show our new cars there. So hopefully they purchase a car and we'll keep this thing going. So it's 20 years. Wow. (laughs) Well, obviously it's, it's grown significantly. It's it's not a, a a small event with just uh, Ferraris or Lamborghinis anymore. So uh, what, you know, tell us a little bit about what the events look like today and, and, and why you've maintained that passion for what you're doing over this time. Well, it's interesting. So it's, it's like a runaway train in a good way. It's been a it's been a roller coaster ride, but it's exciting and fun, and I, and I like that even though it is a great deal of work. But what's happened is, yeah, the events have moved into a much larger scale. I mean, typically this this weekend's event in St. Petersburg will have four hundred cars, uh, could be eight thousand, could be eighteen thousand people. Wow. Uh, it shows in its twentieth year, so we we have a very loyal following there. It's overlooking the water. It's beautiful. So the passion end of it is really, you know, at the end of the day, when you see a 1957-58 vintage Ferrari or Aston Martin drive past you to go onto a show field, it's, uh, it's a pretty incredible experience. And uh, also just the young and old, you know, you'll see somebody that spent five years 
restoring a 68 Camaro in the garage with their dad. And, you know, this kid's 14 years old. Now it's years later and he's finishing the car. And so I like to see how people evolve. And I like the different types of vehicles and the personalities uh, that we bring together because it really is. It's like one very large family. Yeah, you've got a, I mean, you've got a large following, not just, I mean, obviously you work with automotive dealerships that, that, you know, tend to show up in, in a large format and at, at, at the shows, but you, you also have a great following among, uh, whether it's somebody with an individual car or somebody that has a, a collection of cars, um, you know, what, what are some, what, what have you seen as far as the, the passion that some of your exhibitors have, why are, why are they there? You know, not the automotive dealerships. We know why they're there, but yeah. you know, why is somebody bringing that, that 1967 vehicle to your, to your show or a 1957 vehicle to the show? What's, what's, what's the passion behind them? Well, there's a couple of things to that. So first and foremost, I think they want to share the, the love they have of this vehicle, whether it's a vintage Ferrari or even a, you know, beautifully restored 58 Buick, whatever it is, it's irrelevant. They, they spend a lot of time and a lot of the, many of the cases, they spend a lot of money and they want to share this vehicle. They, they want other people to see the beauty of it. They want to pop the hood and show them how long it took to bring this motor back to looking like the day uh, it came off the showroom floor. Uh, so there's that. But there's also the, there's a family and a camaraderie amongst the car collectors most of the people that come to my events are couples and they enjoy seeing each other every few months at the events that we produce and other events, of course. So they like that. They, they come into town, they'll make a, a three day weekend of it. Like St. Pete is typically they'll check in Thursday or Friday and they'll go golfing and eat, drink and be merry. Uh, they watch us when they place their car, they watch us build the event on Saturday and they spend time, of course, on Sunday with them, all of their 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 buddies, and they just you know, eat, drink, and be merry, and share the great stories about their cars, you know. And uh, it's it's the family, I think, that they yeah. really enjoy. They like winning the awards, of course. We have beautiful trophies, all sponsored by Destiny Family, yeah. and they are beautiful. And you know, sometimes I I'm, I'm happy just to to look at the look on their face, but. I think at the end of the day, it's about being around the family of other fellow car lovers. Yeah. Do, and I don't, I don't know this answer as many shows as I've been to. I mean, I know you've got a lot of, of huge collectors out there that just have you know, a, a, a garage or, or, uh, you know, even, even like a, a, a big showroom of cars. And then you have, you know, s s the individual that, that has one car that's their, you know, uh, the, whether it was their, their high school car that they fixed up. Or, you know, there's some sort of connection there typically, but what do you see a lot of both or is it more driven by an individual with a singular car or somebody that's more on the collector side? Well, most of our attendees at display cars are what I would refer to, and this is just my term, a mid-level collector. Let's say this is a person that's got four to 15 cars. Let's forget about the value of the car. Mm -hmm. So nice show cars in general. Then we have like an apex collector. You know, you're talking 100, 150 cars, significant cars. These are incredible collections. You know, Ralph Lauren, I don't know if he's got 150, but he's got a lot of cars. And he's got an eye for picking cars that I think personally is second to none. He picks some of the most beautiful cars in the world. And I think he picks them first for the beauty, could care less about the return on investment when he goes to sell it. I, from what I've seen, and I don't know him personally, but he buys out of true passion. So we have people that'll have anywhere from four or five to 10, 15 cars, moderately priced, and that's a collector. And then we have, you know, I'll refer to as the big dogs that have these significant collections. But the passion really at the end of the day is all the same. Um, I have some clients where their garage is just the structure of the garage is as beautiful or more beautiful than what most people would consider a, a magnificent mansion to live in. Marble floors, just the best of everything, just the house, the car collection. 
you know, you're talking millions and millions of dollars just in the structure that's housing the cars. Hmm. Forget about the $150 million worth of cars inside of it. Well, and then you have all the structures that are being built now to, to house people's yeah. collectible cars. That, I mean, that's, that's, kind of, that's really just kind of come on the last several years, right? That is, and I don't know investments the way you do, but I can tell you one thing. That is something that most of the very wealthy car collectors that I deal with are all looking to invest in, 100%. Car lockers, call it what you want. It's basically tracks even. There's yeah, like motor enclave in Tampa. Yeah. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars in development, a track with car condos is like the, the normal phrase you hear. Hmm. So on the first floor, all the cars, marble floors, tile floors, whatever it is. And then the second level is the loft with the cocktail bar and the best furniture and the sound systems and you know, I would think these gentlemen are spending a lot of time at their car condo, condo and less time at the house yeah. because <laughs> it's, it's these, the main cave. Well, it's and they're beautiful, yeah. you know, and it's not just guys, though. You know, I'll give you an example. We have right now at least 30 percent of my collectors are female they're okay. women. Oh, yeah. yeah. And that number is growing every year. And I I always tried to target couples from day one because I knew that at the end of the day. If you're going to go out with your spouse, it's great if you're if you're the car nut and all you want to do is stare at the engine, talk about the motor. That's fine. But it oftentimes the woman is like, OK, I can handle one day of this, but it's getting a little old. Well, we try to entertain them both. And I think that's part of our success that we can do that. But the female car collector demographic market, if you will, is growing rapidly. There's a lot of women with significant car collections out there. Very cool. Actually, I, I, I was not aware of that. Yeah, it's uh, it's grown sharp exotics. You'll you'll meet them on Sunday, and it's a woman, and she's got twelve supercars. I'm not even talking just walking in and buying a daily driver Lamborghini. We're talking hypercars, wow. which is that next level. Yeah, and uh, self made. <laughs> very yeah. very cool. All right, so Joe, I want to get back to one of the comments I made earlier, which is, you know, the the buying the childhood dream car. Now, you know, I have a nice car. I'm not a, a, a exotic car collector by any stretch, but you know, with with my collection of sports memorabilia, a lot of it reverts back to my childhood and what I was doing and what I was thinking. I, I'm sure you see a lot of that among your collectors, and, and I'd like a, a comment on that. But then. Also a follow-up on, you know, what are you seeing different that has changed in your 20 years in the business as far as new people entering the market? Why, you know, what's what's attracting new people to come to your show and be a participant in your show? Well, I call it the nostalgia effect, and uh, it's 100% across the board with everyone. I I rarely have talked to a car owner at whatever age, 18 years old or 75 or 90, irrelevant, who doesn't say, you know, this car was on a poster in my room. A perfect example is a Lamborghini Countach in the 80s. Or, or my my neighbor had this car and I, I just looked at it for 10 years and always wanted that car. Uh, so the nostalgia factor, I believe, in my opinion, drives probably. Still, still real. Huh? Oh, it's 100% real. Yeah. And I'd say it's I say for, on, for the average person, it's probably 90% of the driving force of why they pick a car. I mean, once they start buying a lot of cars, then it becomes a little different. But I know a very significant collector in Orlando, uh, just for privacy, I'll keep the name out of it. This gentleman has cars that some of the vehicles are $27 million cars. One of the first cars he purchased to start his collection was when he came out of college, was an 82 Chevrolet Corvette Collector Edition. It was a limited edition car. And I actually had that car <laughs> when I was uh, younger as well. So when I'm looking at this collection, I see all these vintage Ferraris, all these incredibly expensive cars. I see this car and I said, I personally think the world of this car. I said, but I'm surprised it's in your collection. And he told me that I saw this car when I was a young man and I swore the day I could afford it, 
um, when I start to collect cars, this is going to be one of the first cars I buy, if not the first. And it was. That was the first car. So that whole nostalgia. So that car, that car was so important to him that it doesn't even really fit in with yeah. his other cars. But it's it's probably still his most important car that he owns. It would be to him. It would be like me walking in. Let's say you have a collection Babe Ruth limited edition back from the early days. Of, let's just say it's almost priceless. And then you had a softball from a little league game that played on Sunday. And I'm like. That's interesting. You have all what? What's the story behind yeah. that? And it's nostalgia. So that nostalgia also continues, and I see it now. I've been in this twenty years, so I'm kind of seeing the collectors that were older when I first started kind of um, move on. You know, I wouldn't say age out, but the new collectors are coming in, mm -hmm. and they are the younger generation that are buying the cars that when they were children or young men or girls and they saw and it was their dream car so those cars are now what from the the 90s i was gonna say mid 80s or so like i yep. I, I see like a, a big car like when i was in school was like a toyota sell or not a yeah. toyota supra yes like a you know mid 80s late 80s maybe even early 90s model and, and yes. i've seen that there's been you know a lot of demand for that well that's you just hit the nail right on the head and it's an interesting example because you and i would on average, we probably would never realize this, but I remember a few years ago already, a Supra went for like $95,000, which is really kind of caught my eye because I was like, wow, that's a lot of money for a mm -hmm. late 80s Supra. I remember seeing those just everywhere, you know, and now all of a sudden it's becoming a collectible car. So yeah. now the, you know, the younger guys that are 28, 30 years old are buying the cars that were important to them where... I'm looking at that car and a lot of these are the Japanese sports cars. And I never thought they would get the dollars that they're getting now, but they are because they're collectible and they yeah. want them. demand. I mean, it's demand, demand. demand, demand drives everything. That's exactly right. Yeah. So that's what keeps the young people coming into the, uh, the club, so to speak. Well, you've, you've mentioned, and I've also mentioned my personal sports memorabilia collection a couple of times. And a as you know, um, I've, I've purchased my, collection out of the passion for what I have in, in collecting that. But the reality is, is my collection has also become a part of my personal investment portfolio because it's, it, I mean, it's performed well. Mm -hmm. So I, I've got a couple of questions for you revolving around that. First is, is do you feel that most of the owners that, that you're aware of are passionate about their cars or do they look at them as an investment or is it more of a combination? It, well, you have two different types of people and uh, it, it is a combination, but it, there's two very distinct collectors. There is the collector now that's been around for a while, has bought and sold cars privately, not even a dealer, just you know, amongst their friends, let's say for the last 35 years. So they really know the market. For the most part, a lot of those, when they're dropping significant money on a car, they're not just buying it out of 100% passion anymore because they've probably had a similar car to that over the last 35 years. What they've done, especially in the last four or five years with the pandemic and everything really drove prices up through the roof, they're buying with a very serious commitment to the investment. Uh, the other side of the coin is people just buy a car 100% out of passion, could care less what the resale value is. I'll tell you a hilarious story on that four or five million dollar Bugatti, Chiron, uh, came to my event two years ago. And the gentleman was smoking a cigarette inside of his Bugatti, which <laughs> you buy a Bugatti, it's your Bugatti, you do yeah. whatever you want. But I heard- But you and I would look at that and say, that's insane. <laughs> well, yeah, well, it, now if you bought that car as an investment, yeah. you would never do that. Absolutely. So I heard somebody walk up, it's my friend Phil, and he said, I don't think I've ever seen anybody smoking a cigarette inside of a Bugatti Chiron. Because I know it's your car. Because I just love the fact that you just that spirit. He goes, look, I'm not worried about the trade in value, and it just it floored us. Yeah, it was just first of all, it was hilarious. And he goes, no, he goes, I, yeah, I bought the value this car because like he didn't care. He bought that car because he wanted that car, 
Yeah, but um, that's not like a multi-million dollar car, right? It's like a four four million dollar car. Wow. Three yeah. to four million dollars. Let's just say forget about options and everything else. I mean, mm-hmm. a, a cup holder and a Pagani Wira, because they don't have that as an option. If you want one, I know a guy that wanted one. Uh, last I checked on it, it was a fifteen thousand dollar option <laughs> to hold this cup of coffee, right? Wow. So that's total passion. I could care less. And then you have the people that buy them with the sole intention of flipping this car, you know, like anything else. I'm, I'm sure in uh, uh, the sports memorabilia world, you have that uh, uh, very almost identical patterns. I'm Absolutely. sure. Yep. I mean, sure. it has to be. Oh, for sure. For sure. So. So secondly, and, and this is, again, talking about my personal situation, but, you know, I, I realized that I had a real issue from a planning standpoint. So one of the things that I've done is I've developed a scorecard to address 10 issues that, Anybody that has a high-end collectible um, collection, you know, ought, ought to be evaluating. That could be whether it's sports memorabilia or artwork or exotic cars. But my own personal biggest concern was my family doesn't really understand what I have. They don't understand the value of what I have. And if God forbid I don't, I didn't make it home that night, they wouldn't know what to do with it, where to go. And so that that's mm-hmm. been a driving force behind us developing and creating content for uh, collectors. Now, I, I realize exotic cars might be a little different because there's probably a lot of father-son camaraderie with some of these, but I, w- I would have to think there's still some situations that, that you're aware of that somebody has a huge collection, but they're not really addressing what they need to be doing with that collection or what the end use of that collection or even what I would call the succession plan of that collection is. Do you see that? Are you aware of that? Uh, Unfortunately, I see that almost every week where people have significant collections or just, you know, whatever it is, forget about that value, 10, 15 really nice cars. They might be $150,000 each, this car. I see with collections when the cars are millions of dollars per car. What happens is these are very smart people, right? They didn't, you know, you don't build a fortune like that unless you, you know, you've kind of thought through what you're doing, right? But tragedy happens if they don't have all their ducks in a row, so to speak, with a plan, an exit plan, the ultimate exit plan. If it's not written down, literally, if like speaking to someone like you or, or an estate attorney, all of a sudden the wife or the sons and the daughters are left with significant collection of cars they may not know anything about. Even if they have the father-son relationship, they might love the car, but they may not have the father's knowledge of what this car is worth. And I have to tell you, there there's a certain element out there that preys on that. I'm sure. You know, I, I'm e- glad easy, to, easy to take advantage of in that situation. Yeah. Now I like to I'm I'm glad that I haven't seen a lot of it, but I've seen it. And uh if they had thought that all through beforehand and had defense mechanisms in place or if something happened to whoever controlled the collection uh, that would never happen i see it especially in a different world the antique boat world mm. where and, and it's 99 percent. it's the husband that's really into the boat all right he passes away she immediately calls his friend and says i don't know what to do with this i know it's a lot of work i know it's beautiful but old boats are a lot of work i'll just take whatever i can get for it and that that boat, I'm not saying uh, it's always someone that when they buy that, they're taking it. But if she had knowledge, but well, wait a minute, you know, there was only four of these ever built. I know the value. I want a fair price. And, uh, you know, besides the emotional tie, I want a fair price. For this. Right. Nobody wants to see that just getting stolen, basically. Yeah. But I see them, uh, they pass away. And the wife, for the most part, just says, I have to sell this. Hmm. I can't you know, 80 years old, I'm not going to be working. Right. I'm not going to sand a wood boat. <laughs> you know, that's the reality. Those yeah. boats are gorgeous, but they're a lot of work. So, you know, again, different item. It's not an automobile, uh, but I see it all the time in the antique boat world. And I am no expert in the antique boat world, but I've been around that club for the last 15 years. I just know these guys as friends and I, I see it all the time. Yeah, I'm sure it happens all the time. And and again, all worlds of, of collecting, which is is part of the passion I have on the business side of the equation. Yeah, absolutely. So tell me about the, you know, the, the charitable 
uh, contributions that you make. Um, I, I know one of the most recent events that you, you raised money for Make a Wish, and mm-hmm. you've had others that benefit children's hospitals and more. So, what? Wh- tell us why that's important to you. Well, you know, of course, I have children, so I've always just felt to me it was just kind of a no brainer. I mean, you should always have a charity involved in some way, shape, or form. And these people, especially ones that are very wealthy, for the most part, they they want to support. They want to try to do the right thing. You know, it's not just, hey, look at my expensive car. You know, we'll we'll bid on an auction item when that money is going to charity. So we try to support, make a wish, give kids the world, whatever it might be. We, you know, like St. Petersburg, we have a no kill animal shelter for the last four years. And uh, (laughs) they're so appreciative of it. What we do is sometimes we'll just write a check. But for the most part, what I try to do is find a charity where I will let them know that, listen, I will build this platform. I will build a venue. I will guarantee you that the people that can support beyond your wildest dreams will be there. It's going to be your job to get them motivated to support your charity. Uh, So we donate. Now, of course, we donate VIP packages. I've donated uh, VIP tickets, rooms at the Ritz-Carlton or the World Equestrian Center, whatever it is. I'll donate, you know, a thousand general admission tickets and sell, just let them know, sell them and keep all the money. So we try to do whatever we can, but I always feel you have to have that component. Yeah. You know, and it, it's well, nice. It's, it's great. Well, it's great to be able to give back. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. To, yeah. You know, to, to the great community and yeah. where you're involved. Yeah. And some of these uh, car events, you know, not just ours. I mean, you look at Pebble Beach. I mean, it's one of the most significant concours, if not the most significant concours in the globe. I mean, they raise hundreds of millions of dollars for charities. Uh, It's a little different ballgame over there. (laughs) No (laughs) no pun intended. But, uh, you know, Jay Leno is always usually behind that. And they they raise a lot of money. It's amazing. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So uh, in in closing, you're uh, kind of smack dab in the middle of your business busy season. Tell us a little bit about some events that you have going on and tell our listeners how to learn more about Festivals of Speed and your events. Well, the easiest way to learn about us is, of course, we have a website, festivalsofspeed.com, but they can always call us. All of our information is on the website. <laughs> Everything we do is posted on there, usually at least six months, sometimes a year in advance. So there's plenty of time. We're mainly in Florida. We operate at uh, fun cities, you know, Miami, Naples. It's Carlton, Orlando, St. Petersburg, the World Equestrian Center in Ocala, which is just incredible. You wouldn't believe that property is in Ocala. Yeah, it's an amazing, it's an amazing uh, location for sure. Uh, so we we rotate through the area. And uh, this weekend is St. Pete. That's one of our largest. We've been there 20 years. Uh, they, they're they always, you can buy everything ticket wise right off the website. 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Awesome. Um, so we have a lot going on. Well, thanks. Well, it's been uh, great introducing you uh, and Festivals of Speed to our fan base. And uh, as always, we're happy to continue to sponsor your events and we'll be doing so for uh, you know the, the ongoing future. We hope that our listeners enjoyed today's episode of Significance of Wealth and will continue to tune into future episodes. Connect with us at DestinyFamilyOffice.com on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube and Reddit and recommend our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Until next time, signing out. Good talking to you, Tom. Thanks, Jeff. On behalf of Tom Ruggi and Destiny Family Office, we hope you enjoyed today's episode of The Significance of Wealth and will continue to tune into future episodes. Connect with us at destinyfamilyoffice.com on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and Reddit, and recommend our podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Until next time. The expressed views, thoughts, and opinions in this episode of The Significance of Wealth belong solely to the host and or guests and are not investment recommendations or offers to buy or sell securities or private investments by Destiny Wealth Partners or its affiliates. This podcast is for informational and educational purposes only. The funds discussed are typically for qualified purchasers, defined as $5 million of investment net worth, exclusive of primary residence.